part saying their father because he's lost him in Ecuadorian embassy. A son couldn't say goodbye to his grandfather who passed away recently. A mother couldn't hold her son and comfort him in his grief in his grandfather. In a world away, in the United States, there's a man named Bradley Manning who is now sitting in a US military cell. He's afraid and alone and he's facing life behind bars for exposing, allegedly, leaking from material that exposed war crimes to the police. Cherished members of families are torn apart from those they love as we stand here today. And it is because of this and our own humanity and sense of justice that we must honour the information that has been revealed by WikiLeaks and for those who have died as a result of those war crimes. How can we honour this information? By taking the time to read it. We have to read it, remember it, tell other people about it, and unite in a call for justice and accountability for the war crimes that have been exposed. The culture of impunity and injustice that WikiLeaks has revealed to us around the so-called war on terror is nothing short of criminal. Apart from the countless deaths of civilians, women, children, families, we know more about the horrors endured as a tactic of the so-called war on terror as well. From the darkness of Camp Delta in Guantanamo Bay, we were shown in the leaked standard operating procedure manual that the US hid detainees from the ICRC the Red Cross that was sent there to protect them. They didn't want the outside world to know the torture that they were enduring. The manual also details the psychological torture technique that the detainees were facing. We heard things about sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation, and how the people who were there to protect them, the doctors and psychologists, were participating in their interrogation struggling them against their will and interrogating them to express false confession. We found that many of the men were actually held without a child or child who were innocent to their fear of the death. There are people still languishing in these detention centers all over the world. There are still 167 men still in Guantanamo. Last month there were 168. The missing human being is Adnan Latif, who was first released, released in 2008, and four years later he was found dead in his cell last month. This man has suffered unspeakable torment for over a decade. As a man cleared for release, but left to suffer because of his nationality. And so he died alone in the hell of Guantanamo. Thanks to WikiLeaks and Brave Mr. Flores, we know about the horrific war crimes and the killing of civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other small countries around the world. We know about the torture of countless human beings, the corruption and disregard for human rights embedded in corporations, and the lies of government to their own people. And unfortunately, our own government is in that mix. We know that it allowed Australian citizens to be held abroad. We know that they knew what was happening to them. We need an independent and open investigation to find out exactly what they knew. And this is a matter of transparency to make sure that it never happens again, not to Julian Assange, not to any other human being. What we know about our world and our leaders, and because of the great sacrifice that people have made to release the truth, has placed great responsibility on all of us. We can't unknow what we have been told. We can't pretend that we don't know it. We need to bring words like truth, justice, dignity and integrity back to the forefront of our consciousness. These words should not just be pulled out by politicians on special occasions like election campaigns. We need to see a follow through by nations adhering to internationally recognised human rights standards that were created to protect the vulnerable. There is no clause in human rights or humanitarian law that says that these protections 
are only suited when it's politically convenient. It doesn't work like that. Part of this call for justice is to bring justice to those innocent human beings who have been killed in politically motivated and needless war and violence. And I'm not talking about violent retribution, but acknowledgement and peaceful reparation. We need an independent investigation. The war in Iraq would be a start, and, and the detainees in Guantanamo. We must also call for greater protection for whistleblowers, those brave men and women who conscience who put themselves on the line to be asked the truth. So let us speak together as courageous citizens, not as enemies of the state, but as friends of peace, justice and human rights. This is our responsibility as holders of the information that we can make has revealed for us. I'll leave you with the last final thought. Justice is not a concept that only belongs in the courtroom. It is for all of us to create. So let's go and create it together. So now I'll just read um, the statement from Kelly Chang. much regret that I can't be with you today. May I start by offering my condolences to Christine and Julian Assange and family for the loss of their beloved father and grandfather this week. As a political refugee, Julian Assange is not a grant of permission to visit his dying grandfather. Yet even in wars, these fires have been negotiated to enable both sides to tend to their wounded and bury their dead. Next, I want to thank and acknowledge everyone who is here today. There can be no more noble cause than to stand publicly shoulder to shoulder with your fellow citizens in opposition to injustices brought to bear on the individuals who refuse to abandon honesty and principle in the face of adversity. Your presence here today is an act for our common good and it deserves much praise. I hope the God has rewarded your humanity with a clear blue sky. Okay, well, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Those who have lost their way and say that Wiki Leach and Julian Assange are enemies of the state, I want to be more accurate to say that they are enemies of the present state. In our present state, unfortunately, it's safer and more comfortable and profitable for many to conform with authorities, whether through active participation or silence, they can stand against the wrong. Even if that means to go into illegal wars, cruel inhuman and degrading treatment, torture, unlawful rendition, exodus for killing, surveying innocent civilians, incarcerating political detention, and disregarding the exploitation of other people on the planet. So ordinary people without thinking become part of the living dead, oblivious to truth and justice, and submissive to the unsympathy. But through your actions today, and the value of your words, whether written or spoken, you ease the burden and strengthen the resolve of those seeking to see themselves from this nightmare. And people who see, see the reality. The US military analysts recently accused of communicating with the enemy, revealed that they follow UK total law enforcement, friends of Bradley Manning, and supporters of the Korean Assad government. She attended a meeting at Dr. Law College. She said she was not subversive. any organisation or their belief, but her beliefs were on her own based on what she had read publicly in the Guardian and the New York Times newspaper. She said she loved the United States, but would not approve of the treatment of Bradley Money. She said that she didn't agree with the military values because they were incompatible with her personal beliefs, citing so US military involvement in that kind of torture, which is contrary to what she stood for. She thought WikiLeaks was a good thing and that some things should not be kept secret. A view being bolstered by watching the video of the helicopter shooting in unarmed man. So who knows who knows who may walk past today or who may be watching online. I suspect that there are more than a few souls tormented by official secrets that compromise the fundamental human values that we all hold dear. Your presence today may unlock them from their anguish and provide the support, compassion and encouragement to do what they think is right. As to Julian Assange and Bradley Manning, 
I cannot underestimate the enormity of what you have stated for that individual. We cannot ever forget the importance of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the protection of whistleblowers, the presumption of innocence, and international human rights law. I wish you all the best to say our part of the Thank you so much, Terry, and thank you so much, Eloisa, from the Justice Campaign. And thank you so much to Paul, who has managed to rid us of um, a, a lot of the sound system. Now, I'd like to call on Senator Lee Annan to come forward. I hope she won't mind jumping up on the vehicle, because I think it's nice to be able to be seen. Well done. Senator Lee Annan, um, our Green Senator from New South Wales, hardly needs an introduction, but I will say she has been one of the strongest defenders of civil rights and human rights and the right to free speech of any parliamentarian, either state or federal. I do acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay tribute to their history, their culture and their ongoing contribution to our communities. We serve here today in support of Julian Assange and Bradley Manning. They are very courageous people. Whistleblowers and the people who publish their material deserve our support. I do believe we have a real responsibility to regularly come together and publicly display that support. So often these people suffer for the stand that they have taken because they are enabling the world citizens to read about some of the horrors that the governments and the authorities of this world perpetrate on innocent people and then in turn the lies that they manufacture to try and justify those actions. And I think it's worth us remembering the huge contribution that WikiLeaks has made. Just a few of the areas that they have, they have released documents on in on the Afghanistan war, the Afghanistan and Iraqi lot war logs. Then they've seen the important secret files on the Guantanamo Bay detention centre. And then there was that incredible video of the Baghdad airstrike that resulted in residents and journalists being killed. That's a huge contribution to exposing the wars that so many of us have taken, a, the unjust war that so many of us have taken a stand against over the years. I think it's particularly important that we give what we do remember about Bradley Manning. If he did release those documents, I congratulate him. But right now, he is being really treated appallingly. And I'll just run through some of the situation. He was arrested in May 2010. He's now been um, held in jail for 840 days. February next year, his case is due to come before the court, and by then he will have been held for 980 days. Why I give you those figures is because under the, the US's own military rule book, when soldiers are charged, they're only supposed to be held for 120 days before the trial occurs. So clearly it is time he was released. And the Greens certainly call, uh, support the call of his defence that the charges against him are dismissed. To Julian Assange, we say an enormous thank you and congratulations. How proud are we that he is an Australian? I mean, that is the truth. Part of him and ashamed of the Australian government's failure to stand up for an Australian citizen just to do their job, just to go up there and make diplomatic representations on behalf of an Australian citizen who is being done over by foreign governments. So we indeed thank him for all his work for transparency, which for us must be a foundation of the democratic process. It's also time to thank the Ecuadorian government. The Ecuadorian government has done what the Australian government failed to do. And not only that, and not only that, they did it in two months. Over the past two years, the Australian government should have looked into um, Julian Assange's case. That's what the Ecuadorian government did. And after that two months, they concluded that he had very good grounds for believing that he would be persecuted, 
and that his own government was not representing him. And that's why he went to the Ecuadorian government and fortunately for him and for all of us, he was given um, sanctuary there. So, who we can't thank is Foreign Minister Bob Carr. That's somebody who we are ashamed of the way he handled this. He tells us that, that there is no U.S. case against Julian Assange. Well, you wonder about what the briefing papers are that he reads. Because a senior U.S. spokesperson from the State Department just last month said that they have a legal case against Julian Assange. And then since 2010, in the United States in Virginia, there are moves to seek a warrant for the prosecution of Julian Assange. And it's understood that the charges that they are looking at are computer hacking or espionage. It's out there. Why well, doesn't that car know? And therefore, I think it's actually relevant for us to ask, why isn't he doing anything? And there's a very simple conclusion you come to, either direct pressure from the US, or otherwise it's another case where it's another Australian government thinking they'll genuflect to the, the US masters. My, my colleague, Senator Scott Ludlam, who looks after this issue for the Greens, has been tireless in the uh, questions that he has put to Minister Bob Carr. And that's something that I think it's fair to remind ourselves that there still is action that Bob Carr can take. We're not talking about contrary assistance, that's about passports and if you get sick. We're talking about diplomatic intervention. Bob Carr often tries to distort the request from the Greens to say we want him to intervene legally. Of course that's not the case. But there are diplomatic actions that he can and should undertake. For instance, it's time that he picks up the phone and asks the Swedish authorities what their plans are. For two years, the Swedish authorities have been making noises, but no charges, no, no, no comments about what they're actually going to do to Julian Assange. The Australian government could ask for that information and supply it to Julian Assange's legal team. Australia should also be calling on the British authorities to lay off the Ecuadorian embassy. As you know, there is a long history, more than a hundred years, of precedent around diplomatic compounds. And that is a very important part, again, of our rights as citizens and how nations interact. And here we saw the British police, obviously under orders, really overstepping the mark. Again, an area where the foreign minister should have stepped in and just said to his British counterpart, called off, abide by international convention. And right now, also, the foreign minister should be ringing the US Department of Justice or the Department of State and asking if the US plan to prosecute Julian Assange. I guess detailed the information that's out there in the public domain. Who should ask officially, get an official answer, and again, supply to Julian Assange's legal team. There's nothing wrong with that, and we would argue that is the service that an Australian government should give to an Australian citizen. <laughs> What it all adds up to is that the Australian authorities have well and truly abandoned Julian Assange. And it's again worth us remembering that when this story first broke about the courageous work of WikiLeaks, we had the Prime Minister straight out into the media saying how their work is illegal. It's not illegal. She's now been told that time and time again. But she has not retracted her statement, as she should. So we have an Australian government that's not doing its job, but the Australian public certainly has not abandoned Julian Assange. His demand for transparency is something we will continue to support. But there's so much more that we need to do in Australia about what is happening in this country. And just briefly, I wanted to tell you about laws that the federal government is looking at to bring in a requirement that internet providers would have to keep the records the phone calls and the internet records of all citizens for two years. But all your use of email, Twitter, Facebook, the web, can for two years. I, I mean, it's just unbelievable they even came up with that idea. And they need the strongest voice to ensure that's shown in the dustbin of Parliament as quickly as possible. So, to the organisers, congratulations for this event today. 
I'm very proud to be able to stand here representing the Greens with all of you taking our stand with Julian Assange. We need to be uh, raising our voice because transparency needs to be the foundation of government, not surveillance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Levy Adams. I'd like to now call on Anthony Lowenstein, um, who I think will be known to many of you as an independent journalist and author. He's been writing about the Abigail of Liberty League for at least six years. Anthony has also just recently returned from Afghanistan. Thank you. One of the things that Lee was just doing there was to read some facts. And I think when it comes to issue with you in Afghanistan, our facts are often sorely missing. We have to get used to an idea that our Prime Minister talks about the noble war that we're fighting over there. A few facts before I begin. Since 2001, at least 2,000 US soldiers have died. 2.4 million US soldiers have served in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. At least 100,000 Iraqi and Afghan US war veterans treated for post-traumatic stress last year alone in the US. There are, of course, untold numbers of Afghan and Iraqi civilians. Probably at least a million Iraqis, at least 100,000 Afghans. No one actually knows the exact figure. So when we talk about a noble war, when we hear our Prime Minister and the US President and the British Prime Minister and a range of other leaders talk about what this war is about. It's about one thing and one thing only. It's about revenge for 9-11. That's what this is about. One thing and one thing only. One of the things that we also should not forget is that in 2001 when this war started, the vast majority of the media and political elite supported the war, endorsed it, backed it, said this war was going to be quick and easy. Here we are 11 years on, the longest war in US history, and we have what can only be called a clusterfuck of major proportions. Uh, yeah. When I was, as Tom was just said, I was in Afghanistan a few months ago, and one of the things that strikes you there, I was there as a journalist, one of the things that strikes you there, not as a soldier, one of the things that strikes you as a observer is the fact that the West has no idea what they are doing there. When you have a situation 11 years on after this war began, and you realize the fact, as one small example, that they are paying corporations insane amounts of money to privatize intelligence, but the very fact they don't know what Afghans are thinking down the road. You have a situation where they have no understanding that a resistance that has formed since 2001 has now beaten the, the most powerful military in the world. We actually should celebrate that rather than condemn it. This obviously is the war that we're told we actually have to fight. The war, in fact, that the majority of Australians, which people often forget, have been opposed to for at least four years. The vast majority of Australians for at least four years do not support this war. And despite that, as Lee said, there is bipartisan support in the Australian Parliament for this war. Bipartisan support. And it's even possible that Tony Abbott wins next year, he in fact will increase the number of troops, as he said he might do last year. The connection to WikiLeaks in some ways is quite clear. WikiLeaks released, as many of you will know, the Afghan war log a few years ago. And the key point of those logs was very clear. It showed in explicit detail, as the indeed the Iraq war logs did, what this war actually was about. It wasn't about fighting terrorism at all. It was in fact the opposite of that. In fact, it was to commit a war on civilians to try and make them scared of what the US actually was doing. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the majority of Afghans who are in Afghanistan today, they've opposed the occupation for years, for years and years and years. And WikiLeaks, amongst many other campaigns, should be celebrated and praised for what they're doing. In fact, the opposite in Australia seems to be true. Yet again, we find politicians failing. Both sides of politics, Labor and Liberal, have not shown support for WikiLeaks. The great majority of the public do. Public opinion poll, one after another show, the songs and his cause actually here is popular. People support what they are doing. So although often we feel as civilians that our voices are not being heard, in fact they are. The government knows it. They know it. 
But as we, uh, we say, what we're talking about here is being reflected into the U.S. It's very clear the decisions about WikiLeaks are not made in Canberra or indeed London, they're made in Washington. One of the things that came out recently, which I think Lee touched on, was that the Assange has been called by the U.S. military enemy of the state. And this actually means that Julian Assange is regarded in exactly the same way, in terms of the U.S. military perspective, as an al-Qaeda terrorist or the Taliban. Let's just think about that for a second. If that means that someone who is a journalist and a writer and a whistleblower is regarded in the same way as Osama bin Laden, we have to think about ourselves why the Australian government has not come out more strongly and condemned that. There has been nothing about that. And if that is the case, then all of us, in theory, are enemies of the state. All of us. And that's something we should be very, very concerned about. One of the things that as the journalist has written about this for many years is to see how few in the media today, in 2012, actually stand up for what WikiLeaks is about. For years there was some support in some circles. That has shifted. If one looks at many mainstream news organisations today, there are some exceptions, but the majority of news organisations, it's far easier to mock Assange, to mock the case, and not what he stands for, and actually stand up for what journalism should be about. Assange has often said in the last six years, and I started writing about WikiLeaks from 2006 when they first started. In fact, this month is the six year anniversary since WikiLeaks was founded in Melbourne. But Assange regularly says that why has my organisation in six years had more leaks and more information than all the corporate media combined in the last 30 years? Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. The short answer is that the vast majority, with exception, of the corporate press doesn't see itself as a watchdog, it sees itself as an enforcer of state power. That's what the media sees its role as, regardless of what they say. It's very, very clear. Yeah. One of the things that is, and I think a few speakers have touched on this, it's important for us to remember is that we as Australians and as Americans and as Westerners who have been occupying Afghanistan for so many years, we actually owe the Afghan people compensation. We owe them a responsibility what we've done to their country for 11 years. The country in 2001 was hardly in great shape. That's a given. But in the last 11 years, the country actually has been decimated. So when most Western forces, not all, but most Western forces leave in about two years, that's the current plan, we are leaving a country in ruin. And the responsibility for that lies with Australians and Americans and British and a range of other governments that have occupied that country. And to me, like with Iraq, we have a responsibility financially to compensate civilians and people who have suffered because of our behaviour for the last 11 years. So I want to end with saying, I commend this event to say that most Australians are on our side, regardless of what you read in the press, or you're on the ABC, or Fairfax, and these limited on the Australian Parliament, we actually are on the same side, you're defending what is right. And with you, it shows us what journalism can be, and the Afghan war is a war that in many ways will be defined in exactly the same way as Vietnam. A complete disaster. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. I'd like to now call on Marty from our, our range of the Stop, um, Support Assange and Wikileaks Coalition, who is going to read a very remarkable statement. This has come to us from the Afghan Peace Volunteers. It's been decided to fight on, on an obviously non-violent basis for peace in Afghanistan. Um, Marty will tell us a little bit about um, the, how this came into being, and then read their greetings from, from um, them to us today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Afghan Peace Volunteers are a group of people in Afghanistan who are working for peace and who are trying to stop the war in their country. They became acquainted, I suppose in a way, with Gail Malone, who is a supporter of the Support Assange and WikiLeaks Coalition, and they were delighted they were delighted to find that somebody in the West was working and an organization was working so hard to bring the troops out of Afghanistan and let the country take care of itself. The 
Afghan peace volunteers have written a statement which they wish to have read today after the 11 years of war in their country. I, if you want to find out more about the Afghan peace volunteers, you can look at the global days of this meeting on the web and you'll find out more. But this is the statement which they read. In protest of the 11 year of the U.S. and NATO war in Afghanistan. Said, Dear Ricky Leakes, stop the war coalition and other friends. That's all of you here. We thank you for all the work that you do for a more transparent, just, and peaceful world. After 11 years of the U.S.-NATO war in Afghanistan and the three decades of war before that, we are very tired of the killing. This war cannot stop the war. The human method of war just doesn't work. Afghans have a saying that blood cannot wash away blood, and we've witnessed and experienced its truth daily. The U.S. has lost 2,000 of their soldiers. Afghans have lost at least 2 million loved ones over the past four decades of war. Stop. Stop the killing. Stop the mutual bloodshed. Stop spending $2 billion U.S. dollars a week just on killing. Stop the drones. Stop the use of depleted uranium. Stop. Ordinary Afghans don't need more weapons or more war. We need food, water, shelter, and clothing. We need education, health care, and decent livelihoods for all. We also need friends. We wish to remember the 2 million Afghan victims of war by finding 2 million friends for peace in Afghanistan. The Afghan peace volunteers ask for a ceasefire from all warring groups. We want peace, the peace which is the color, soul, and jewel of life without which we live bearing fears and worries, and without which life has little meaning. In 2010, we, the Afghan peace volunteers, inscribed our beliefs and hopes on a plaque that sits at the entrance of Birmingham Peace Park in the center of Afghanistan. Why not love? Why not bring peace? Even a little of our love is stronger than the wars of the world. This is signed from the Afghan peace volunteers, and they are with me today who are standing here. Thank you so much, Martin. You had ways to jump up on the ute. People can be close to the ute. This is one of the, the um, um, foundation stones of our efforts to defend the sound in the Hiddick in Sydney. And you'll see the band of all our events, and it's been a most important element of supporting our efforts. So thank you so much to Matt. I asked Kathy and Finley, some of the supporters of the Hiddick in Sydney, Street now to jump up. She's going to read a statement from Austin McCurry, who is another independent journalist who recently spent some considerable number of months incarcerated by the authorities in Egypt. Thank you, Anne. This is from Austin. For those of you who haven't heard of the story, I'm a freelance journalist who's also faced the wrath of a foreign government in the course of doing my work. Whilst attempting to interview a union leader in the town of Bahala, my colleagues and I were mobbed and arrested. Three days later, we were released on battle facing charges of incitement. For six months, my family, friends, union and thousands of other supporters in Egypt, Australia and elsewhere campaigned hard. At the same time as this, the embassy staff here in Cairo made constant efforts on my behalf. Nothing happened. I stayed on a travel van, stuck, with the threat of jail hanging over my head. They had me right where they wanted me. The Foreign Minister, Bob Carr, was conspicuous in his absence, clearly wanting nothing to do with the case. That was until it was time for him to go to Egypt to make contact with the new government. Coming and going and leaving me here without resolving the issue would have been too embarrassing and opened for him a fresh round of hassle from my supporters and the MEAA. Carr finally raised the issue with the Egyptian ambassador to Australia within a week 
we were pleased news that charges had been dropped. The implications of this are clear. If Carl was serious about helping Assange, he wouldn't be relying on the consular staff. He would be doing something himself. It's his job to guarantee Assange, who is the most important Australian journalist of his generation by a mile, and arguably the most important Australian in history, is not punished for the truth he has told. Some may think that I'm overstating my case here by suggesting Assange may be Australia's greatest gift to the world yet. I would ask them to consider the story of a massacre in Ishaq, a town in central Iraq where US troops executed at least 10 Iraqi civilians, including a woman in her 70s and a five-month-old child, calling in an airstrike afterwards to incinerate the evidence. The confirmation of it in America's own documents made available by WikiLeaks in Iraq was explosive. This happened just as the U.S. was attempting to negotiate con continued immunity from Iraqi law for U.S. soldiers. The public pressure was too much, and the Malawi government had to refuse. It was this decision that forced Obama into keeping his promise and ending the Iraq war. This is just one of hundreds of stories around the world of how WikiLeaks documents are arming those who fight for justice with the one thing that has always been their secret weapon, the truth. You won't hear these stories on Channel 9 or even on the ABC or SBS. Even stronger than the taboo preventing the substantive discussion of oppression is the taboo against acknowledgement of victories from below. WikiLeaks is, as history will remember, perhaps the greatest such victory so far this century. Let me try to explain why. The French philosopher Michel Foucault, when seeking to capture the essence of power in modern society, looked closely at the institution of the prison. The, the archetypically modern prison Foucault held was the Panopticon. In this design, cells are arranged in rings around a central guard tower. The wall of the cell that faces inwards towards the tower is transparent. The cells are well lit. The guard can see into any cell at any time. The guard tower, however, is darkened and obscured. He can see them, but they can't see him. They can't even tell if one is on duty or not. What this means is that they can never know if and when they are being observed, and so must assume at all times that they are. Surveillance, to quote Foucault, is permanent in its effects, even if it is discontinuous in its actions. Elsewhere, he puts it more crisply, saying simply, visibility is a trap. Like prisoners in the Panopticon, it is impossible for those of you who have made it here today to know if and when you are under electronic surveillance. Somebody could be listening to this speech through the microphone in your Nokia right now. Your every movement and conversation could be logged. One can never know if the sentry's eye is on them, and so one must act always as though it is. What WikiLeaks, the intelligence agency of the people, is trying to do is turn the lights on in the guard tower. This is our only option. To leave ourselves naked to the invasions of privacy, which we know every government is tempted to indulge in, whilst allowing them to operate in unaccountable secrecy, is a more total surrender than people want to realise. To give up this fight is to turn ourselves into permanent children, to surrender our freedom, our dignity, to a state that will, if it can, decide for us in all things. Put power itself under the strictest of surveillance. You can start right now by keeping your camera phones rolling on the cops if they get too pushy. I'm sure this letter has been too long already, and so we'll now close with a quote from the famous protest band Rage Against the Machine. The song is called Voice of the Voiceless. It says, and all well tell, a terror era coming through, but this little brother is watching you too. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Austin, and thank you, Cathy, for reading it. And I am reminded from both both speakers before us that not only is this getting found that absolutely at odds over the question of wishing to be supporting Julian Assange and demanding our government say up for him, it is absolutely at odds with the majority of Australians over the question of the Afghanistan war. How much longer are we going to put up with our power of being so unrepresentative of our views? On that note, I'll call on Chris Inkebney to come up and speak for, for the Stop the War Coalition 
to talk about particularly Afghanistan and what WikiLeaks has actually been able to do to make it clear to everybody what a disaster this war is to both Australia and an utter catastrophe to the Afghan people. For twenty years he lost the year. For twenty years he made it here. Will we remember or forget when Julian is in prison? were released by WikiLeaks on July, in July 2010. Julian Assange faced by an expecting world press gave a PowerPoint presentation with the words, it's a war, the same thing, over and over again. A controversy ensued as to whether the lives of US and Afghan citizens were endangered by these revelations. This debate still rages, but some of the legal journalists saying the Guardian newspaper, in their haste to soup, hurried Assange into publishing these 90,000 tables. For my own sanity, I will work merely from the Guardian table, which, being the work of a journalist who wish to retain their position in journalism, will be framed for the needs of the 1%. As war dogs, the raw data is also framed in military speech and in the perpetual usage of the word enemy. That is, those who resent the occupation of their country and the exploitation of their resources and may subsume their anger and fear into religious fundamentalism. <laughs> Our perception of the video, Collateral Murder, was also framed by Assange's title and by the explication of the US soldiers' chat about their home and sweetheart. The usage of the State Department and military expression, Enemy of the State, frames the perception of the WikiLeaks project for those in the West, controlled by the fear and security control engendered by 9-11. I will briefly check the Guardian's five areas of inquiry within the framing of my knowledge as an anti-war activist and hope that you will take the time to follow the logs yourself. Afghanistan was invaded in October 2001. In fact, in a few days' time, we reach that anniversary. These logs end in 2009, so again, there is a freeze. But these wars, we know, are intended to continue for resources and global strategy, while the sense of the capital shock doctrine project is manufactured through fear and racism. We're going in. Secret war along the Pakistan border. 
I'm going to read out a tiny amount of a log reference. I won't bore you with the other numbers. December 2005, T, 2852533986352, etc. Enemy attempted to regress across the border. However, the CJS OSS returned fire and relieved it on the enemy. The Guardian notes, and I quote, Secret intelligence files reveal tensions between Allies and potential to be drinking his tea one day and sparking each other the next, including evidence of crossing over sides in the middle of a car park. This crossover may have two causes, one being tribal loyalty and the other the lure of more pay for victims of deprivation and imperialism. Two, Pakistan and Taliban aid. Despite the Guardian's assertion that the logs contain little evidence of Pakistani intelligence involvement, that is the ISI, with the Taliban, the Obama administration said that safe patient haven to extremists in North Afghanistan pose an intolerable threat to the Afghan people and the Guardian said. are linked to the security agencies who are hostile to the ISI. The Pakistani intelligence agency's response to the file is to deny the double game, which the US more recently accused them of doing. However, more than 180 files substantiate the claims that the ISA trained Taliban since 2004. Three, death of civilians and Afghan forces. 300 Afghan war logs deal with the UK forces involvement and 21 occasions. The files report a Harrier bombing resulting in eight deaths where US helicopters picked up the body. An unmanned drone, but the facility of others, was claimed by the US to have killed six Taliban. But a Guardian eyewitness claimed this resulted in the death of six. The Afghan war logs also report the ISAS vehicle, that is IED, but the Guardian correspondent insists insists for the cover up and that the victims were in hospital as a result of UK soldiers' revenge. Many were killed and 22 wounded. These are isolated incidents of a former battle. Afghan forces were part of vengeful attacks on US forces by training Afghan forces. Sorry, training Afghan forces appear on our news quite frequently. That Afghan forces have repelled their enemy many times in history is not acknowledged, and it is assumed these are Taliban France. As well as the drone strike, incidents such as these, these are resentment already engendered by occupation for the capitalist project. 6 4, 2006, our forces blew up their, their own vehicles and wounded 13 Afghan police thought to be Taliban. 14 to January 2008, they decided to use a heat-seeking high-explosive anti-tech missile they were carrying called Javier. They saw what they thought was Taliban activity and in their confusion killed an Afghan trainee, one of their own. This is, that's right. This is just a glimpse into the wall of via somewhat embedded guardian. Please visit the wall of yourself. You might do a search, investigate the glossary provided by Wikileaks, and do it yourself. We are all Julian Assange, we are all Bradley Manning and we can all be scientific yes. Thank you so much, Director Christine. As Christine says, we have all much to learn by using the enormous resources which Ricky Beach Sanctuary Assange has put at our disposal. We have a duty to inform ourselves that on that basis we can take up this fight with our own rotten government. We're going to call our last speaker now, who is Paul McAleer, who's speaking here from the NUA. Um, 
Well, I'm saying that people have been very, very patient to start the weather. I'm not quite sure whether we're going to be pleased to actually allow us tomorrow, so we may wrap up here, but I would invite people when we finish to go down to Martin Place and your own thing. If I call on Paul now, please. Comrades and friends, how are you all? We're here today for a couple of reasons, and it's a real shame that we have to continue to come and rally to these sorts of simple justice issues. We're here today to basically demonstrate once again our support for Julian Assange, Bobby Manning and Ricky Leake, as well as uh, the 11th anniversary of this most terrible unjust war in Afghanistan. Put simply, we are living in a capitalist dictatorship. It's as simple as that. And we can recognise that in, in a multitude of ways, philosophically, ideologically, and all the rest of it. But a very simple demonstration of it is the fact that today, tonight, is considered current affairs, and Assange is uh, basically considered a terrorist. But that's the simple fact of the matter. We are all victims of this capitalist dictatorship. All victims. Who are the winners? The winners are the corporations and the 1% who continue to bombard people with murder and genocide simply to produce more profits for themselves. The fact is that transparency is a victim. Ignorance is a winner. We have people who are blind to what is occurring. People are blind to what is occurring because the facts can't get to them. The truth can't get to them because those who expose the truth are locked up, criminalised, and then all the sorts of things that we're seeing done for WikiLeaks. We need to ensure that truth is held in the regard that it needs to be. And the fact is that it simply isn't. Too many of us who stand up are labelled terrorists or enemies or any other the words to describe us. The union movement has to do much more. I'm a representative of the union movement. I'm a representative of the Maritime Union of Australia. We have had a history of opposing imperialist wars. We continue to do so. We resolved earlier this year at our national conference to support WikiLeaks, to support Julian Assange, to support Bradley Manning. But the fact is that the union movement isn't what it used to be. The union movement used to stand up on issues of social justice. But today the union movement is so inwardly focused because of the attacks that we're sustaining. When workers' rights are diminished in the ways that they are, when workers are have to basically stand up for, the, for their immediate rights, then issues of social justice tend to get pushed to the background. But it's up to unions, like the MUA and like others who continue to stand up, to continue to prosecute the case for peace. Assange is bigger than himself, and while Assange is an incredibly important human being, it's what he represents that is incredibly important. And it's what he represents that he is such a, a dangerous human being. The fact is that Assange is part of a, a, a broad, it is a broad group of journalists. We're seeing it more and more. The internet is allowing um, journalists, real journalists, to put the truth out there. But it's not happening in the ways that it needs to be. We need to ensure that Assange is not silent. We need to ensure that we do more than simply come to a town hall on a Saturday and spend a couple of hours listening to a number of speakers. We are failing. It's as simple as that. We are failing. And we're failing for a number of reasons, but we're failing because whilst we come to these sorts of meetings, we're not doing enough in our community. And we have to start talking to ourselves in this way. Where there's a 50, 100 people in today, but there's millions of people in this city that go about their lives not recognising that millions of people are being brutalised. Millions of people are continuing to live in a country that was illegally invaded. Millions of people suffer over 4,000 days of horror. And that's what the war in Afghanistan represents. Now, a side note is I, I, I did paint those skirmish for an hour. I got shot about 35 times within about an hour and a half. And I recognised how easy it was to be shot. And I thought just how scary it would be to live in a war zone. Just how scary and horrific it would be to not know whether my children are going to be shot or murdered or going to have a missile or a bomb explode in our house. How sick is our society that we can turn a blind eye to this horror, this absolute horror that is being perpetrated on a people that simply do not deserve it. A people 
They live in sweat. A people who deserve a war in their country. A people who deserve a war on poverty. A people who deserve a war to ensure that they are educated. A people who deserve a war to ensure that they can have proper health care. Those are the wars that the Afghan people deserve. The Afghan people do not deserve the war that we are inflicting upon them. And what about democracy? Real democracy, not the bullshit democracy that exists today. There is a real bullshit in the commentaries, not only of the media commentators, but also the politicians. They spout this idea that somehow we are living back in a democratic society. Who of these people voted for war in Afghanistan? No one did. It was an act of parliament and a shameful act of faith. And I'm sickened by the fact that I can stand here and have my say that people like Julian Assange is locked up in a consulate, or probably many, is locked up in a prison cell, and what is he facing? And no one can say that uh, Assange is going to be um, entitled to a free trial. I think Assange should be, um, should have to confront the charges that he's faced with. But not in a way that's going to deny his fundamental rights. Every human deserves to have their fundamental rights protected and they're not being given. They're not being given to what we do. We sit down and do nothing. And most of us do nothing. And the guys who are standing here today need to understand that duty and responsibility. They can be the fight. To go into our communities, our workplaces in particular, and say to people what's going on. Because they're not getting it from today to night. They're not getting it from Alan Jones. How the hell is that man talk about and write it as some sort of journalist. I listened to um, some of the commentary where Alan Jones was writing as someone who is just providing information to the people. What a joke. It's a sick joke being played upon us and we're lapping it up. We're lapping it up in droves. And that's the real shame. You know, the democracy says this idea that we must protect things. That, you know, the police make sure that a window is not smashed but they don't go and, and ensure that workers' rights are protected. There are so many issues that we're confronted with. These are only two today that we're discussing. But I would ask everyone, not to listen to me or the other, other speakers, there's enough information out there for each and every one of us to understand, but it, the, the issue is to do. To do. We all need to do a lot more. We need to talk to our families exactly. There's no point having a rally of 50 people. We need to create a mass movement, and the mass movement is there. Whenever you see information being provided to people, whether it's about war in Afghanistan or a farm in which you left, the people support the position that we're putting. But I think they're alienated. They're alienated by the fact that whatever they do just doesn't seem to work. But we need to be encouraged. We need to be encouraged about what we represent as well, and that there are many people, and there's many organisations, whether they're political or industrial, that are out there trying to create a message to build the campaigns against it. So I, I implore everyone who's here today, in what is somewhat a miserable day, but certainly not the misery that's being inflicted upon the people of Afghanistan or all the other wars around the world. The people who live in desperate hunger, the people who live in desperate poverty. That's the real misery that we need to ensure that we overcome. So I thank you once again for the opportunity. I'm sick to death of coming to these rallies and talking. I would much prefer, I'd be much, uh, it'd be a much better system that we would live in where we could talk about issues that are issues about people being murdered. So thank you once again, and I'll see you all again shortly, because this war won't stop. Thank you so much, Paul. I hope you all take part at the next call for action. I'm now very pleased to announce uh, um, to this crowd here today that we are going to hear Miguel Nicole sing the WikiLeaks song for us. Thank you. But not just me, of course. You are also involved. You're here. Um, now, you've heard this song before. Dennis Aubrey couldn't make it today. He asked me funny enough a few days ago and asked me would I, would I learn it for him. So, I uh, need your help in the course particularly. A helicopter, gunship crew, thought they were only actors. A video shows men and children used for target practice. WikiLeaks released it, it's not rumour now, it's fact, it's evidence of cowboys shooting up the town. 
and your chamber is secret and not sacred anymore. We know what you're doing in your dirty little world. It's the same thing you've been doing time and time and time before. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. Now you can do a lot better than that, I think. I think maybe maybe some of you need some help with the word. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. We know what you're doing in your dirty little world. It's the same thing you've been doing time and time and time before. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. It's hard to keep a secret in this age of information. Push one little button and it's on every TV station. And anyone with eyes knows the situation now because Julian Assange is around. And your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. We know what you're doing in your dirty little world. It's the same thing you've been doing time and time and time before. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. Once upon a time, you know, when I was in my youth, the Yankee U.S. Army war machine will cover up the truth. But they can't do it anymore, because now we've got the proof of the way they like to throw their weight around. And their dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. We know what you're doing in your dirty little world. It's the same thing you've been doing time and time and time before. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. Remember that old saying, that she's a messenger. Well, Julian Assange, she's a messenger. She's not a traitor. He held up a mirror to the people of the USA to show them what was really going down. And your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. We know what you're doing in your dirty little hole. It's the same thing you've been doing time and time and time before. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. We know what you're doing in your dirty little war. It's the same thing you've been doing time and time and time before. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. Your dirty little secret ain't a secret anymore. Well, thank you. You've been a wonderful crowd. And if you'd like to be a choir, part of the choir that rehearses regularly, come and see me after. Thank you so much, Ms. Geraldine. I think we really needed that speech, particularly after that poor reduction, sort of, you know, so much interaction. Look, we're wrapping up here. I'm afraid we're our numbers have uh, uh, dwindled because I'm afraid it's been a bit miserable standing here in the rain. So we're not going to march down to Mountain Place. I suggest that people make their way down there because the occupied Sydney people are streaming live from Adelaide. The forum on WikiLeaks and Assange is just happening right this moment in Adelaide, so it'd be worth getting down there. But I have a couple of things to mention to you. One of the things I'd like to tell people about, which I probably don't know, that a couple of weeks ago, the Aboriginal community in Sydney presented to Julian Assange's father, John Shipton, an Aboriginal passport. Now this is a mark of signal honour and I to tell people this, this is really quite a remarkable thing to have happened. I was told that today that in fact Julian Assange has received his Aboriginal passport in London. So he may have been abandoned by the Australian government because the only Aboriginal people have given him leave to travel in their land. Last two things. This is not the end of the action as poor as reminded us. The support of Sanjay and Wikileaks Coalition meets regularly at the, in the UGS Foyer in the Tower Block in Broadway. We'll be meeting next on the 17th of October. I hope we'll see people who have not been along before to join us again to plan our next action. We have a lot of different actions coming up. Next weekend, the... Oh, the glasses on. The, it's occupied, the Sydney organisation has organised a march and a rally. 
we will be starting um, at 11 a.m. Um, outside the UK Consulate in Circular Quay, that's down in Circular Quay, and it will finish up in, in um, the occupied Sydney side, going by the depot offices in Pitt Street and the U.S. Consulate in Mountain Place. This march is called the Wind of Truth, and it's been organised to support Julian Assange, but also Bradley Manning. And next Sunday, on the 14th of October, the Bunning and Pier Town Hall, there will be a rally in the support of refugee rights. I'm sure you are mindful of the truly terrible things that have been done by our government, again in our name, without our support or permission, to oppress refugees. Two million of refugees left in, in the Iraq war, 4.5 million refugees from Afghanistan, and our only response is to wave the finger and say they're both people and lock them up. This is shameful, so I call on you to all be here next Sunday at 1 o'clock to march in support of refugees. Because this, after all, is what Julian Assange is. I thank you so much for coming today and for your patience with this in a long series of speeches, excellent as they have been. And send me out again, support us on to Wikileaks, we have to stop the war in Afghanistan, and it's what you do, each and every one of you, which will make the difference. Thank you.